letter than I have right here. And I've never seen a greater effort for outreach in the community like I've seen here. It is just amazing. And uh, to your credit, last night, many, many people left here very thankful for what they received, not just in the message, but uh, in the meal, but just in the hospitality that you showed. It was outstanding. My wife kept lingering, waiting for her number to get called. She had her eye on something. I don't know what it was, but anyway, I know it wasn't a fishing pole because I bought her a new fishing pole, and she still hasn't used it. So, I mean, no need to get another one, right? And she blames me. She said, you got to take me, and then I'll use it. But, uh, no, I tell you, it was great. Thank you. And love your pastor. I'll tell you, he's got a wonderful family. I appreciate Brother and Mrs. Brown. They're a blessing. I love to hear your preacher preach. You know this. Of course, sometimes we get used to things, but I hope you realize what a blessing you have in your man of God. He preaches faithfully, and uh, God is using him greatly here at church. You're blessed. Sunday school hour. Man, that was good stuff. I'm yes, telling you, that was outstanding. You're, you're getting some good stuff. If you're not coming in for Sunday school, let me encourage you to do that. My wife and I were both just really enjoying it. Brother Jeremiah, thank you. Good, good Sunday school lesson. And uh, the records, he had three of them. Brother Bob, you got three, right? Didn't I see three albums over there? The first one after every teardrop. We did two before that, but we don't even let those show up in public anymore. We were teenagers when we did those, and uh, I started uh, singing right after I got saved. I sang my first song in church, and Dad said, all right, do a solo, and then do a song with these girls. Well, there were four little girls in our church, including my wife and my sister, and they were called the Sunshine Girls. Now, singing with the Sunshine Girls... That's really not cool. And uh, so there was a man visiting the service, and he liked it and said, Hey, I'm going to talk to our pastor, see if we can have you come. We're having a big youth meeting. And we went there, and of course they had to have a name, so they called it the Sunshine Girls and Kenny. And uh, I don't like Kenny, but I really don't like Sunshine Girls and Kenny. But anyway, we did that for about the first year of our music and then changed the name to the Blessed Hope Singers. And... Uh, but I will tell you this, crazy thing happened. My niece was uh, in Australia. I think they call it an all pair. Here we call them a babysitter glorified. But anyway, and uh, she was working for a lady who has um, uh, beauty shops and boutiques. And they were opening a new one and trying to decide on the name. And my niece had told her about my sister and, and uh, the group that we sang in. That we were originally called uh, Sunshine Girls and Kenny. And then they changed the name to... The Blessed Oak Singers, and she even had one of the albums with her. And so the lady decided that when she opened her new boat, by the way, this would only go in Australia. They have a beauty shop there, a boutique there called uh, uh, Kenny and the Sunshine Girls. <laughs> and they have a parrot named Kenny as the mascot for the store. I'm not making this up. And uh, this was in some kind of a national magazine. I'm thinking, don't put my last name, you know, because I mean, it's a weird shop. I mean, they do women's hair, and I'm not being critical, but what they do to it is scary. But anyway, and because uh, they don't just do normal stuff. I mean, you know, they do the multicolor and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so somewhere in Australia, there is a, a beauty shop with a bird named after me and uh, the, the Sunshine Girls and Kenny. And they even have in the a shop there, they have a framed... Uh, photo album or an album in a, in a frame of uh, us singing so it's hilarious but anyway uh, the things that happen when you are a child you never think will come back to haunt you by the way I'm old enough to have recorded records eight tracks cassettes everything was going to be the you know uh, new thing to end all and then CDs and now they're obsolete my truck doesn't even have a CD player. It's too sophisticated for that. And I'm not. And so I'm, I'm, I know technology and you got to keep up with it, but who in the world does? But anyway, not old people, but I'm just saying. You know, some of you older ones will say, I do. Well, I guess I'm too old. But anyway, it's been good. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts. And while you're going there, let me just say again, it is an honor to have Miss Graham uh, with me. I'm always thankful when she can be with me. You know, our children are grown. We do have one daughter that's not married yet. She is at home. She's in Bible college. She just turned 
22. And uh, so Bernay is the baby of the family. And uh, Bernay is writing a book. In the Bible, there's a lot taught about the uh, rights of the firstborn. She's writing a book called uh, The Biblical Rights of the Lastborn. She thinks she can prove biblically that it is her right to be spoiled as the youngest <laughs> child. I think she's making it up. But anyway, and uh, I've actually had people, you know, contact her. Hey, I want that book when you get it done. And uh, it'll all be made up, I promise you. There'll be no Bible to it. But anyway, Acts chapter 26, if you have your Bibles, let's stand if you're able for the reading of God's Word. And then I'll let you be seated right after I pray. And if you're not able, you won't offend me because I struggle at times uh, myself. So Acts chapter 26. Paul, of course, is making appearance before different magistrates, authorities, as he's coming towards the end of his life and ministry. He said in verse 12, Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Now he's going there to try to stamp out Christianity. He's giving his testimony here of what had happened to him. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, and of them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things of which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but first showed unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem, throughout all the coasts of Judea, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and new works meet for repentance. For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, Witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than that which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should raise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Verse 26, for the king knoweth of these things, before whom I speak, also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, O most, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Father, I pray that you would fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, give us liberty, clarity of thought, and that anointing power from on high. We promise to give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. And amen. You may be seated. It's an amazing passage of Scripture here as you get into the latter part of the book of Acts. And Paul, of course, is making an appearance, talking about, and of course, as he's on trial because of his preaching of the Word of God. And, and I just want you to notice three big things with me this morning out of this passage. And then, of course, a hundred thousand little things. Isn't that how preachers do? I just have three things to give you today. And then it's like number one, number one, one, one. But anyway, number one, notice Paul's commitment. As Paul begins to speak here in verse 18, and uh, he's telling, of course, his testimony, how that he got saved, how he met the road on, of the Lord, rather, on the road to Damascus, and how God had, had uh, met with him there, and uh, how that he got saved and his life was forever changed. You know, I was thinking about that. We never know. Last night, there were some people that made profession of faith, and, and uh, we had the privilege of seeing people saved, as you do at our church and in our ministry. One of the things God's allowed us to do in the years that I've been there is to travel and uh, go to different places and other countries. 
countries and take the gospel and we're thankful for that year after year we're in the Philippines and uh, this year Miss Graham and I went to Japan did a, uh, a family conference there at a military church and, and God really worked it. it's amazing how God can bring a preacher from Arkansas to Eagle Cooney, Japan and uh, get there and then allow us to minister to a family whose son was killed in the plane crash that happened December 6th there in Eagle Cooney while they were refueling only because we had a connection to one of the other men that died because he was uh, from Tremont, Illinois. And uh, all that worked together to allow us to be able to meet that family and begin to uh, share our faith with them. I'm just simply saying God works uh, in uh, mysterious ways that His Amen. wonders to Amen. perform. Amen. Went to the Philippines and once again saw thousands of people. And I don't say that to boast come to know Christ. It's not just me. There's a lot of uh, people that go, a lot of men, Brother John Robertson, other preachers that go, and God just opens the door year after year, and honestly, we cannot fulfill all the opportunities we have to share the gospel. The city of Victorious, a new church has been planted there within the last two years, and, and the city of Victorious invited us to come and to preach to their city workers, more than a thousand employees. They stood them outside and were standing on this grand platform in front of their municipal hall. And this has happened on at least four different occasions when I've been in the Philippines. God went to God that some preacher that preaches the gospel could get in the front of every worker in America at our civic uh, uh, hall halls and our, yeah, our government preach. facilities yes. and, the, and the Congress, etc. And give the gospel yeah. clearly yeah. and be allowed not only to preach the gospel, but even to give a public invitation. Yeah. Yes, sir. What a joy it was to see many of their workers, policemen and street workers and secretaries and, and tax collectors. I love preaching to tax collectors. All these workers out there hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and having an opportunity to be saved. And I say all of that. Paul is all about trying to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. And we ought to be about the same thing. Right. We see the challenge he had to bring a message. Paul begins to speak in verse uh, 18. And he says, here's, here's the message God wants me to preach. The challenge is that I'm going to preach a message, first of all, to open their eyes. He said to take away blindness. Do you understand that people that are lost without God are blinded and cannot see the truth? Right. Have you ever tried to witness to somebody and it's like they just can't get it. They can't figure it out. It's like it makes no sense to them. And then maybe all of a sudden the light comes on and it dawns on them. Hey, uh, that's what they're talking about. Hey, listen, to open the eyes of the blind, but not only to take away blindness, but to take away the blackness of night. He said to turn them from darkness to light, Amen. to take them from the darkness of sin to the light of the glorious gospel of yes. the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy it is to see Amen. lives changed forever. By the way, Brother Jeremiah said it, and our testimonies are similar. I was raised in a preacher's home, got saved at the age of 12. And I'm not bragging today. I, I know what the world is like, but I, I've never been involved in what some people would think of as deep sin. I, I've never known what it's like to have a tobacco habit. I have no idea what that's like and don't want to know. I don't have any idea what it's like to drink alcohol. I've never tasted one drop of liquor in my life. So you're bragging. No, I'm grateful. Amen. Amen. I know this. If you don't take the first drink, you'll never become a drunkard. Right, right. But I've never tasted liquor. I've had some nasty medicine, but I've never tasted liquor. <laughs> I, I don't know what it's like to do illicit drugs. And you know, I've literally had people say this. When I was a teenage preacher, I'd be preaching youth revivals. I actually had people say to me, I don't know how you can relate to young people because you've never experienced the world. I said, well, I never stepped in front of a semi that was doing 70 miles an hour, but I saw a guy that did that looked so bad, I don't need to try. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do drugs to reach a drug addict. You don't have to become a drunkard to reach a drunkard. And thank God for everybody that's saved out of that lifestyle. But I will tell you this, whether you get saved as a child or whether you get saved as a middle-aged adult or you get saved as a senior citizen, when you get saved, you pass from darkness to light. All things are become new. What a difference Jesus makes in it. Amen. And he said not only that, but to take away the bondage. Take them from the power of Satan unto God. To break the bondage. That psalm said he breaks the power of yeah. canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. For his blood uh, can make the vilest clean. His blood availed for me. What a blessing it is 
to know the freedom that comes from your sins being forgiven and then to take away the brokenness. Listen to what he said. Paul said that I was to preach to them that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. Now here's where we all fit in. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none right. So brother him. Uh, most of us here are saved today. But let's, let's don't forget what God has done for Thank us. Amen. Right. Forgiven our sins. Thank you. By the way, someone said we need to be as good to ourselves as God is. And if God has forgiven you, why don't you just forget it and move on? Say amen right there. Good. Amen. So the challenge to bring a message, then the consistency of the message. Paul said uh, as he was given this challenge, verse 19, Where unto, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. In other words, God said, Paul, here's what I've called you to do. Go out and preach this message. And he said, I've been faithfully doing that. People haven't always liked it. People haven't always received it. People haven't always embraced it. But Paul said, everywhere I've gone, I've carried the good news of salvation. What a blessing to know we have the answer. We see the consistency of his message. He said, I took it everywhere. Uh, to, uh, he said, first unto them of Damascus. Well, I was on my way to Damascus. So I got there and said, hey, listen, I was actually coming here to kill y'all but and put you in prison, but uh, I got saved. Yeah. Not only it's wrong, but you know, some of them early Christians were a little skeptical of him. Sure. And who could blame them? Right. And uh, man, it must have been an exciting moment when Ananias said, brother Saul. <laughs> and then the brethren... Back at the church in Jerusalem, said, I don't know what to think about this guy. He could be a plant. He could be an imposter. Barnabas said, No, nah, he's the real deal. Y'all yeah. need to, you all need to be Brother Paul. He's not the same as he used to be. And oh, listen, isn't it great when someone gets saved? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, yeah. church, listen, if you've been Go saved ahead. a while, don't lose the joy of watching new conquests. That's right. Amen. We have an amazing jail and prison ministry at our church, and we're grateful for that. And a lot of my people spend a lot of time in jail, and some of them are there serving the Lord. <laughs> when I first went to Benton, the only way I could get in the county jail was if a prisoner asked me to come. And then several years ago, God opened the door until now we're there every weekend, every Saturday, Sunday. Our men and our women go and, and, uh, and preach and teach in the men's pod, the men do it, in the ladies' pod, the women do it. God has blessed it tremendously. We've seen a great harvest of souls saved there. I was sitting in my office one day and the phone rang and there was some outfit and they said, hey, we have a magazine that we'd like to uh, send for the prisoners at Saline County. We called the sheriff's department and they said, well, we don't handle that. You'll have to call Pastor Graham at Victory Baptist Church. He handles all of the spiritual matters for our county jail. So they sent, I said, well, send me a copy. I'll see if we can use it. And by the way, the magazine they sent talked about how you could lose your salvation and how you had to do certain things to get saved that were not scriptural. And so guess what? We couldn't use it. Yeah. Right. But I was grateful to have that liberty. Yeah. Just being honest with you. Yeah. And there's enough confusion. I'll tell you, you go in the average prison and they hear anything and everything. Right. Right. And God's blessed. We've got a wonderful, uh, we have a wonderful chapter in our prison down the road from our church and uh, they allow us to come in and of course every Monday we meet and, and do a program uh, similar to what you had with Reformers Unanimous in the prison there. It's gotten so much attention. By the way, and I say this to God be the glory. I know it could change, but so far every man that's graduated from that program that's gotten out of, out of prison has not gone back into prison. Amen. Right now we're at 100%. Say so what? You're bragging. I'm rejoicing. Now, by the way, there's guys that have started the program, didn't finish the program, got out and went back in. But nobody that's graduated from the course has gone back in. I know that'll change someday. But it got the attention of the state of Arkansas, and they asked our men to come, and they've asked if they could take our program statewide. They said, we've got to have what you got. And they said, you don't understand. This is not just a faith-based program. This is a Bible-based program. They said, we don't care. It's working. We want whatever it is you guys are doing. And I'm going to say that to God be the glory and thankful that He's opening doors and, and, and our men have even had to go down to some other prisons to try to, you know, uh, start some services and things. And all that I'm saying is this, it's fun to watch people get saved and grow in the Lord. I'm thinking about a young couple in our church. They'll be there this morning. He probably ushered. He's one of the men in the rotation of our ushers. When they first got saved, man, they both got reached to the jail ministry, drug addicts. They lost their daughter. The state had taken their daughter away. After they got saved and got out and came, followed the Lord in baptism, started growing, went to court, and the judge gave them 
visitation rights that were supervised. And then after a while, gave them unsupervised visitation. And then the judge said to them, I've never seen such a change yeah. in a family's life. We're going to grant you full custody of your daughter. By the way, she's since gotten saved and baptized. The daughter that he had from a previous marriage has gotten saved and baptized. And now every Sunday, they're sitting in church as a family. And I'll tell you, I don't mean this wrong, but it's kind of funny. I remember when he first started ushering, his wife said, you sure you want to do that? Sometimes he calls on the ushers to pray. What are you going to do if he calls on you to pray? He said, I guess I'll pray. She said, and you do? I'm going to bust out laughing. <laughs> and sure enough, after a few times of ushering, I said, Richard, would you come ask the blessing on the offering? And I heard his wife. <laughs> he starts laughing. And you said, well, how was it? Well, it was like a young Christian's prayer. Yeah. But it was real yes, from the heart. I don't want to forget what it's like. Yes, good preacher. Amen. Somebody said to me, oh, you know, they, they got some rough areas in their life. Well, where were we at if it hadn't been? I'm just saying Paul begins to talk about everywhere he went and, and the giving the gospel out. But then not only the consistency of his message, notice the conflict with his message. Isn't it interesting? The people that should have liked what Paul was trying to say were the most angry. The religious leaders wanted to kill him. Verse 21. For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Paul said they wanted to shut me up. They didn't want to hear what I had to say. By the way, man's religion is always contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't care. You name the religion. You can call any name you want to. And I'll promise you this. They all have the same doctrine of salvation. It's called the doctrine of works. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you got to yeah. and, and it's all about what you can do to get to God. But God made a way. Yeah, preacher. You could come to Him. Yeah. They sang about a while ago, it's called yeah. the cross. Yeah. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You don't earn your way to heaven. You don't work your way to heaven. You don't get good enough to get interest into heaven. You come and for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What a blessing it is. Paul's commitment to the gospel. But then notice secondly, Paul's continuance. Paul kept on keeping on. Look at verse number 22. Now here's a guy, I don't mean this wrong, I'm... <coughs> I'm not in love with myself. I hope that I'm less impressed with me, uh, dear friend, as the days go by. But at the same time, I'm not some kind of a guy with the martyr's complex. I don't walk around hoping somebody's going to end my life. If I die, I'm going to heaven. And that's wonderful. Amen. There's something about God's design in a person that causes them to want to live. I mean... We say it now, I've been at Victory 31 years. Do you understand? I was young when I went there. Je Brother Jeremiah asked the question in Sunday school. You remember the first time that your wife or your husband told you they loved you? Did some of you remember that? Or... I do. I was eight. Miss Green was seven. It was in the old kitchen of the church that my dad pastor in Lincoln, Illinois. That quiet, timid girl looked at me and said, I love you. I was thinking, I love baseball. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it took me a while to see the light. I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> we didn't become an item until many years later, but I did remember it. <laughs> but you know, when you get saved by the grace of God, Paul said, I... I think about what God did for me and how He changed my life, but He said they wanted to kill me. And I don't have a martyr's God. I don't go around and say, man, I hope somebody shoots me. If I die, listen, I'm going to heaven. I understand that if I get a disease tomorrow, I'm going to heaven. But understand, God designed me to want to live. For instance, I wanted to, I, I wanted to get married. My principal in high school said when he was a young man, he'd hear preaching on the rapture. And he'd say, oh Lord, please don't come till I get married. I'm going to miss out on it. He said, then I got married and said, even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, that's not my testimony. That was good. Man, I, I look forward to getting married. And then babies. Our first little girl's in heaven and then we have eight children. And I look forward to being a dad. And you know what's amazing is so quickly it goes by. And I'll just be honest with you, I didn't get it all right. Say, preacher, you ever make mistakes raising your children? Oh, actually, I could write a bigger book on the mistakes I made, I think, than the successes I made. But in spite of it, in spite of that, God's been good to us. Amen. 
John said, I had no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in church. Yes. Now I got grandbabies. My oldest grandson will be 19 this year. So anybody's thinking about anyway. I'm just I didn't come to play next week with this trip. Gabe, who has a connection to this church, will be 18 this year. That's crazy. Good young man. Anyway, moving right on. Loves the Lord, called to preach. Anyway, moving right on. Going to Bible college this fall. Just mentioning some things about it. Sings. Anyway. But Paul said they wanted to kill me. Don't you notice two things as Paul continues? In spite of the threats against his life, notice his help in verse 22. Paul said, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. Hey, aren't you glad that when we're in trials, tests, troubles, that we've got help from God? Aren't you glad that there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother? Even when we're in sorrow, even when we're in grief, even when we're facing disappointments, even when we deal with disease, even when death knocks at our door. I found a faithful friend. Jesus is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. Paul said his help was from God. Psalm 121 said this, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Hey, God yeah. is our help, our very present help yeah. in time of need. Yes, sir. But not only his help, notice his hope. In verse 23, Paul makes the statement that Christ should suffer and that He should be first, that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Paul said, I not only have help, he said, I have a hope. Here was his hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be the universal message that would bring hope to all mankind. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a hope we have. Amen. Now, by the way, the word hope in the Bible is not like the way we use hope. Oh, I hope I get a car. I hope I get a job. I hope I get a raise. I hope my husband likes this meal. Or some of you men that cook, I hope my wife likes this meal. Or, and we use hope like a wish. But when the Bible speaks of hope, it's something that we can have steadfast assurance yes. and confidence that it will take place. Yes. Jesus Christ is our blessed hope that He's coming again. What a promise that is. But here's another hope that we have. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Hey, we're not gathered here this morning merely for religious formality. We serve a risen Savior. Our God is alive. He really does care about you. He really is interested in the details of your life. He wants to work and be a part of every detail of your life because right. he's a risen Savior. Yes. To notice thirdly Paul's critics. Paul is criticized. Religion hated his message. I've had people say to me, well you're so narrow minded. You think there's only one way to heaven? I said, but that isn't me. That's the Bible. Amen. Jesus didn't say I'm one of the ways. That's right. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. One of the things I appreciate about the banquet last night, even before the message, even before the meal, it was straight up told, we're here to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody was there under false pretenses. Nobody said, man, I didn't know they were going to do that or I wouldn't have come. They found out and they still stayed. And they still ate. And they still heard the gospel. So well, some of them didn't receive it. That's okay. The seed was planted. That's right. That's right. That's right. And Paul said, when I go and I preach the gospel, it's a message of hope. But religion hated his message. The rulers neglected his message. You know what Felix said to him? Felix said to Paul, I might be interested, but come back a more convenient day. How often have we heard that? Mm. Yeah. I witnessed to a man years ago under such deep conviction. Here's what he told me. He said, I've never heard this before. He said, I'm... I'm past 80 years of age. I've lived a very wicked life. And he said, Preacher, I wish I'd have heard this when I was a young man. I said, it's not too late. His name was Oli. I said, Oli, it's not too late. He said, oh, he said, it wouldn't be fair. How could I ask God to save me? You don't know how wicked. You don't know how vile. You don't know how ungodly I have lived. 
I said, good news only, Jesus died for you. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, Ole didn't get saved. As far as I know, he died without Christ because he just didn't feel like it would be fair to ask God to save him. He said, I won't live much longer. And he said, it just wouldn't be fair. You know, hey, it isn't fair if God saves you as a six-year-old child. It's not about what's fair. It's about God's uh, goodness and His faithfulness to seek and to save that which is lost. Felix said, come to more convenient season. Festus said to him, you're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Much learning hath made me mad. And a lot of people look at us like, man, and people are crazy. Right. You know, the world isn't too upset when you go to church on Sunday morning, but when you start coming Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, the world looks at that and says, man, you're a little too carried away. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And Agrippa said, almost, I'm considering it. And Paul showed as he faced the rulers and their neglect of his message. You think of it. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. In other words, you've read. You know what the Bible says. You know. You've been around this thing long enough. You see, there's no place that the message isn't needed. That's right. I've never gone in. Listen, I think we have to have common sense. I don't walk in a restaurant and tell everybody to stop talking so I can preach to them. But if the opportunity comes for you to witness there's no place that it's a wrong place to share the gospel. And I've had the privilege of, of winning people, Lord. I've had the privilege of passing out tracts. You know, sometimes things happen in life that frustrates us and we wonder why it happens. Yet sometimes God does that and allows us to be in the paths of people that we can share the gospel with. But all that being said, there's no place where the gospel message isn't needed. I've never visited a country, whether it be uh, the Philippines or Japan or Israel or Russia or Haiti or wherever it might be. I've never gone to a place. I've never gone to a state or a city in America that the gospel message isn't the need of the hour. But not only is there no place, there's no person for whom the gospel isn't necessary. Whether they're a pauper or a king. He's saying, man, I'm telling you, I'm giving the gospel to everybody. I'm showing light unto people. I'm telling everybody the good news of salvation. And now he says, let me bring this message to a conclusion. Agrippa, here's a strong request. None of these things are hidden from you. Folks, I want to tell you something. If, you, if you've lived any life at all, you know this. It's appointed unto men once to die. Everybody in here at some point is going to face eternity. Now, short of the rapture taking place, we're all going to go by the way of death. I didn't come to discourage you today, but that's reality. And if you die without Jesus Christ, you'll spend eternity separated from God forever and ever in a place, the Bible said, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So Paul makes a strong request. None of these things are hidden from thee. And so he's making a plea with him. Believest thou the prophets? Agrippa said unto Paul, O most, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What a sad response. <laughs> Almost. Right. Now, I've read commentaries and some say that he wasn't the least bit interested in it. You know, he, this was said in mockery and others have said, no, he really was getting close. I don't know. But the wording here is so powerful. When Miss Graham and I did our recording in CD, we did our recording of songs by Philip Bliss. We recorded 14 songs that either Bliss wrote or he wrote the music to. And Bliss, Philip Bliss wrote the song Almost Persuaded. When we were in the studio and recording that song as I was singing that song, I want to tell you, my heart became overwhelmed. In fact, as I had said to the guy, we need to re-record this because I, I really kind of choked up. Because I started thinking about people that got so close, like Ole, and yet rejected Jesus Christ. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost. I think about a preacher friend of mine. His daughter had grown up in the preacher's home. Married a preacher. And listen, I'm not somebody who goes around trying to get people to doubt their salvation. I don't do that. But she said for several years she knew she was lost. But she kept thinking, if I get saved, I'll be an embarrassment to my dad, who's a great evangelist. I'll be embarrassed, an embarrassment to my husband, who's a faithful pastor. And she had convinced herself it would be better if she died and went to hell rather than embarrass her dad and embarrass her husband. She had made a profession of faith when she was a little girl, but she had no recollection of it. But one day she finally got under such conviction. 
conviction. Amen. She ran to the altar and she said, I may embarrass my dad, I may embarrass my husband, and I don't want to, but I don't want to go to hell. And she was gloriously saved. And by the way, Amen. she found out immediately the devil had been lying to her. Yeah. But yeah. her yeah. husband was rejoicing. Her yeah. dad was yeah. rejoicing. Yeah. Why? Because she got it settled in her heart. Hey, here's the strong request. Will you believe? He said almost, but almost was too late. The reality that serious reality, Paul said, I would to God that thou not only, uh, that not only thou, but also those that hear me this day would, for both almost and altogether, such as I am, except me in bonds. Paul said, I wish your answer was not just almost. I'll think about it. I'm going to do that one of these days. Folks, if you're not saved, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. I know I'm preaching to the church and many of you are saved, faithful saints of God. You're saying, preacher, I don't need a salvation message. I'll tell you what, if we're not careful, we get negligent yes, about sharing our faith, about telling others the good news, about being a testimony, passing out a track, being a witness. You have tools available all over this church. I've already seen them today that you could simply <laughs> hand it. So I've had people say, I'm not a soul winner. I don't know how to talk to people. I'm going to tell you something. Give them a track. That'll get it started. Tell them what Jesus did for you. Tell them what Christ has done in your life. If nothing else, invite them to church. And I promise you this, they're going to hear that Jesus saves. Amen. If you're not saved today, why don't you come and give your heart to Christ? If you're saved today, how serious are you in your walk with God? How long has it been since you talked with the Lord? How's your prayer life? How's your witnessing life? How's your walk with God? Let's stand together. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. That you would help us to be obedient to the Holy Spirit in this invitation. Would you win victories? We pray in Jesus' name. To be saved this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Altar's open. You help yourself anytime. You just come and praise the Lord if you want to. Worship. Bow the knee. Go ahead.